Thankfulness Month. And uh, last Sunday we talked about gratitude. And gratitude is a thankful heart. And that how gratitude is actually thankfulness in action. And uh, if you want some uh, papers on that, what we spoke about, we have them, we can give them to you. Uh, this week uh, is what if I do not feel thankful? And we're going to talk about that. Before we do that, I want to show you that in your bulletin, there's a little piece of paper. It says, I am thankful for dot, dot, dot. Please fill that out. Put it in the offering box and uh, we will read them. You do not have to put your name because uh, if like Cheryl, if she put her name on it, she'd start crying if I read it. And uh, we are going to read those. And I'm going to read a couple that we got from last Sunday. Uh, we want to have a mind and our hearts focus on thanking God this month and what to thank him for. One of the things is our veterans all this week. We've heard about it and it's true. We should be thankful for our veterans. I saw a graphic. It said 2% of our country are veterans and they give up everything for the other 98% and they give up everything for a hundred percent of our rights. And so thank God for the 2% that stand for us that go out to other countries, leave home uh, to protect us and protect our rights. And we are thankful for them. And uh, it's also a sad thing. I think it said, I can't remember, thousands in the last few years of veterans have committed suicide. Why? What are we doing for them? Uh, we should do better for them. Uh, they took care of us. We should take care of them. And, and it's a sad thing, um, and I'm not going to get political, but we take care of other groups that are not even citizens better than we take care of our veterans. I'm just throwing that out there. But thank God for our veterans. Here are two notes that I got about thankful for. I'm going to read them and then we'll get into our sermon. I'm thankful for my family and church family. God has given me for my health and salvation, which God has given me. Thank you, God, for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. Here's another one. I am thankful for the Lord is my shepherd. God has given me uh, eternal life. A wonderful mother that has raised us in a loving and caring home that I could do that I could do that in my home. I can read cursive writing. It just takes a little while. A loving husband who loves the Lord and to help raise our children to know the Lord. That we have a loving and caring God that takes care of us. And that's kind of what we talked about Sunday, that we have a good God. Um, our God is good and he's good to us. And that's kind of the theme of this month to be thanking God because he's good to us. We talked about how other religions have a horrible God. There are other religions that have a God that make you sacrifice other humans. Sacrifice babies. Or they ask you to throw someone in a volcano to please them. Uh, ask you to do all kinds of works to please them. Our God is a good God. He takes care of us. When you think of other gods, you think like a Buddha and a Buddha, they have to bring food to him to feed him. Buddha, when birds poop on him, they have to go clean him up. Buddha, there are soldiers sometimes that protect Buddha. Completely opposite of what our God does. Our God feeds us. Our God cleans us. Our God protects us. We don't have to protect him. There's nothing he needs from us. Our God is a good God, a loving God. We just read in Psalm 3, 
how he takes care of us, even amongst our enemies, and those who want to destroy us, those that want to hurt us, and they're out there, especially Christianity. Our country was founded on Christianity. I don't care what anybody says. If you read history, we were. Now, the anti-Christian movement is so blatant, and there's hatred towards Christianity. Uh, don't think that someday it would not turn to killing Christians, even in our own country. It will. There's two things the world loves to do. Kill Christians and kill Jews. They do. And so we have to remember it is God who fights for us, who protects us, who takes care of us. That is Psalm 3. So we ask the question first, what is your definition of the word thanksgiving? We're going to read here in Ephesians 5 and then Hebrews 13, and then we'll talk about that. He, Ephesians 5, 20, give thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Give thanks for all things, uh, always for all things. Then Hebrews 13, 21, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. One definition of thanksgiving is being well pleased with the divine. Look it up. It's in there in the dictionary. Being well pleased with the divine. Christians are asked to be well pleased, especially with our God. By the Bible, in the Bible, we are told three aspects of being well pleased with our God. We are to be well pleased with God because he is working on us. And some of the things that we think are horrible and bad is to make us better for him, to bring glory to him. We may not see it. We may not feel it at the time, but it's true to make us better for him. Our whole lives as Christian, as Christians is to be for God. And that's what he's working on in our lives. And some of the hardships, here's the thing, in Christianity does not mean that we will not have heartache. Does not mean we won't have sorrow. Does not mean we won't have troubles. We will. And anybody here that's never gone through any of that stuff, please come see me and tell me how you did that because I've had it my whole life. We will. The world is full of troubles, but we have a good God. And everything that happens to us is for our good. To make us stronger, to make us better, to make us happier, believe it or not. And we should not struggle with what God wants for us to do. And how he's trying to change us and make us better. Always well pleased means all the time. Well pleased with everything all the time. Now, I'm human. I'm not always there, am I? And I think if you're honest, you're not either. But that's what God wants from us to always be well pleased with him all the time. Not always there. That's why I wrote the book. Where is God? God, I don't know what you're doing. Why do I have to go through this? What, you know, all these things. Sometimes we question him, but we are to be well pleased with him at all times. <coughs> well pleased with all things. That means each and every thing that we have or go through in our lives to be well pleased with it to appreciate it i rem i gotta you know i always have stories one time my sister asked me to come and make put together this dollhouse for her kids she got this 
elaborate dollhouse and it took me now i'm not harold or some other people around here uh you know i'm not very good at building things and uh, so it took me all afternoon i mean hours to build this dollhouse harold could have had it together in a half hour he he would have just said hey mike you're supposed to do this and that and then it then afterwards i saw there were instructions i should have read those but anyhow it took me all afternoon to build that dollhouse and I told the kids, hey, it's done. And they came downstairs and they grabbed the dollhouse, took it upstairs. I literally just sat down on the couch because she had a Pepsi for me. And I took one sip of my Pepsi and they come crying, it's broken. <laughs> one had pushed the other one into it and broke it. Can you put it back together? <laughs> no. You didn't appreciate all the time and effort I put into it. No. No. We're to be well pleased with all things. You may have a, a car and there's rust all over it. And your neighbor has a brand new car. They're not even a Christian. But here I am, a Christian, and I got this rusty old car. God says, be well pleased with that car. I've had... This was in Chicago. I had a junky old van and uh, we had a storm. We always have storms in Chicago. We had a storm one time and, and mine started, but the neighbor across the road who had the brand new car wouldn't start. <laughs> I was thankful for my junky old van. We're to be pleased with all things and everything that God brings into our lives. To be happy with every situation. We got here, well please, this is God's will. That means acceptance. That's where we struggle. That's where we struggle. To accept this is God's will. And I'm going to live through this. I'm going to have to go through this. Thank God we go through troubles and heartache because God shows himself. He reveals himself in those times. Every heartache, every trouble, every problem I've had to go through, I have gotten closer to my God and he has shown me who he is and what he can do. Thank God for them. It's difficult sometimes in the moment. But the sooner we do and accept God's will, the better off we are. I mean, thank God for everything. Let me tell you a story. This is not my story. Another pastor told this story, but I've always remembered it when I talk about this. Pastors talking about how they were at a church picnic. And uh, they were playing you know out it was outside and uh they were throwing a ball a baseball and one boy threw a baseball way too hard and somehow a little girl got in the middle of it and it hit her in the head he hit her so hard and so bad it knocked her out of course they had to call a lifeline to lifeline her to a hospital and here, she, here they are, she's dri he's driving one of the parents to the hospital and, and some other people with him. And, and he's driving and he had just preached this like that week or the week before about thanking God for everything. And he's driving and he's struggling and say, God, what do you mean everything? What did this little girl do to deserve to, to be in this situation? How can I be thankful for this? It's impossible, God. You're asking us the impossible. That's what he's... See, preachers struggle too, okay? We're human. We can teach it. We can preach it. But sometimes we need God to reveal it to us, just like you. And he's saying, God, this is impossible. You're asking us to do the impossible as he's driving to the hospital. They get to the hospital and there he is. He's supposed to be consoling and, and encouraging the parents the whole time. He's needing it. 
This little girl did nothing. She's innocent. God, why? How could you do this? They're doing the CAT scan on her head where it hit. And they came to the parents and they said, it's a good thing this happened. And they're like, everybody's like, what? We found a tumor in her brain that would have killed her for sure, would have made her, made her disabled in some way. I forget what it was. We would have never found that tumor where it is right now without a CAT scan. And this girl would have never had a need for a CAT scan. By the time we would, it would have been too late if this had not happened. Be thankful for everything. They, they did the surgery, took the little bitty tumor out, didn't bother, fixed. The, I think, I don't know what happened to her head, but they fixed it. Everything's fine. God has a plan. He has a purpose. And it's for our good. Our response is to accept it. And thank him for it. And he's going to make us somebody who's well-pleasing to him. That changed that man's attitude about life immediately. That preacher's. Then he could share it with us. And I'm sharing it now with you. And see how God works. And that story reminds us. And we learn from it. All because she got hit in the head. With a baseball. Even though she didn't deserve it. We are to thank God for all things. Everything. Because he has a plan and a purpose. See, we, we have sometimes a disability on that because we're limited. We're limited. And we think that things just happen willy-nilly. That God says, you know, here's life, live it, good luck. Good luck. Oh, here's some, here's some rules and, you know, this will help here and there, but, you know, good luck. No, no. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. And he has things to come into your life to teach you, to strengthen you, to make you better. And they're on purpose. They're not by accident. And I'm sure if you look back in your life, you can see where the hand of God was working. This would have never happened if this did not happened. She wouldn't be in clarity if it hadn't been for COVID. If this hadn't happened, if God had not done this, I wouldn't be here. Kay and I can say this about our church that we're in right now. We were in a different church. We thought we were there. Uh, that We thought that was it. God had a different plan. He had a different plan. I think I told you the story a couple weeks ago. I would not have been here if God had not moved a man to ask me to speak at the association. I spoke at the association. He was talking to me and I, I told him, I said, I'm no longer the pastor of this one church. Do you still want me to speak? Oh yeah, I'll come and speak. Him learning that I was no longer pastor of the one church told me about this church. Care I, Care and I are like, okay, you know, we'll go, we'll visit. Um, I'll preach anywhere. You can ask me to preach anywhere. I will. Uh, somebody asked me one time, would you preach at a rock concert? Yeah, give me a Bible, give me the time. I'll preach anywhere. And so, yeah, I'll go preach. Came in here, fell in love immediately. This was the heart and soul that we were looking for for in a church. Would have never happened if we hadn't had to go through what we went through for a year. God has a purpose and a plan and a reason. Our job is to accept it and thank him for it. And the sooner we do that, the better off we'll be. You can be well pleased with whatever God brings into your life because he is working on you to create in you someone that is well pleasing to him.
I can be well pleased with whatever he brings if I realize he's doing this to make me better. There used to be a song back in the 70s and the 80s. He's still working on me. You ever heard that song? Yeah, it's true. He's still working on me. I've been a Christian for boom, 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 boom years. Every time I say it, people start hanging up how old I am. Been a Christian for 53 years. Somebody says, you don't look that old. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was born a Christian. No, 53 years I've been a Christian. Is God done working in my life? Is he done working on me? Is he done making me better and making me what he wants me to be? The answer is no. I learn more and more every day. He keeps working on us. I can be well pleased with whatever he brings in my life because he's trying to make me well pleasing to him. But if you're like me, and I think you might be, what if I don't feel thankful? I just don't feel it. God, I just don't get it. I don't understand it. I don't want it. Have you ever told God that? God, I do not want to go through this. I don't want to do this. I don't want this. It's like, that's why I like the Bible saying that he's our father, because we can understand this. You're as a, you as a parent can understand that there's things that you have to make your children do, make them go through, and they don't want to, like get up in the morning and go to school. What if we did everything our children wanted us to do? Wow. I don't want to get up. Okay, it's all right. It's fine. You don't have to go. No, you're getting up. You're going. You're going to school. You're going to enjoy it. I, you know, don't tell me that. You're going to go. But God, I don't want to. I don't want to be here right now. I don't want to do this. I don't want to go through this. I didn't think I'd ever have to go through this. Why me? And I don't feel thankful. How can I be thankful? How can I? Well, the Bible, thank God, doesn't tell us to do something and then doesn't and then never tells us how. Everywhere, either sometimes in the exact same scripture or somewhere else in the Bible, if God tells us to do something or be something, somewhere he tells us how to do it. That's why I love the scripture. And so he tells us to be thankful for all things, everything. But he also tells us how. Philippians 4.4, 4, he says, rejoice always. What if you have nothing to rejoice about? He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Rejoice always. What if I have nothing to rejoice about? What if things are so bad, you just cannot be thankful? And I've been there. Things are so bad. I remember being so depressed. At one point in my life, I'm laying in my bed. And I thought, if I die right now, how long would it take for people to discover the body? That's amazing how the mind can go when you're in this kind of attitude. If you had asked me then and there, are you thankful for what you're going through? The word would be absolutely not. Are you happy with God right now? Absolutely not. I am not. I'm not happy at all. And I didn't feel I felt depressed. I felt judgmental. I felt hateful. And there was always this self that was going through, why me? Why me? I've done everything right. You know, no, I haven't. But in my mind, I have. And I've done everything I could. And I'm, I'm a good person. 
And I, I work for you, Lord. Why me? I figured it would take three days because dad would wonder why he hadn't gotten a hold of me and he'd come find out. So I figured it'd take about three days. See how corrupt the mind can get? That's the struggle. And that's what we're going to talk about. I'll be done soon. The struggle is our mind. I don't feel thankful because of what I'm thinking or focused on. My thoughts. So Philippians 4.8 has six questions to ask yourself whenever the situation you are feeling is unthankful. You begin to feel unthankful and hateful and bitter and angry. Answer these six questions. The Bible talks about how the struggle is in your mind and we're to renew our minds, to think a better way, a different way. Same here. Finally, brethren, this is in Philippians 4, 8, where in Philippians 4, 4, he says, rejoice always. See what I'm saying? He tells you to rejoice always. And the question is, how? I don't always feel thankful. Okay, God says, let me tell you in this chapter how. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, what? Think on these things. Think on these things. Don't focus on the problem. Don't focus on yourself. Don't focus on, I'm innocent, why me? Ask these six things. Number one, what is true in this situation? What is really true about this? What is reality? Not what you assume, but what is actual. You know, you can assume, remember Elijah saying to God after he had a great victory against Jezebel, he ran and, and hid in the cave because Jezebel was going to kill him. And he told God, kill me now because I'm the only, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm the only Christian left. I'm the only one that serves God. I'm it. Kill me and get it over with. What was the reality? Later on, God told him, there are hundreds and thousands of people who still serve me. That's the truth. That's the reality. But he was focused on who? Himself, his problems, not on the truth. He was not alone. The truth, the reality was, there were several other people serving God. The reality is, too, we don't go through anything that someone else in the world has not gone through. We're not the only ones who's lost a parent. There are others. That's the beauty of the Christian church, being in church. Anything you're going through right now, Odds are somebody in that church has gone through it, survived it, and can tell you how. That's the beauty sometimes of what we go through. And after we get through it, we can help others who are going through what we went through. That's the reality. The truth. What is honest in this situation? Who has been genuine to you? Who has shown you respect? Who is genuine? And trust me, when you go through troubles, that's who you look for. The genuine person, not that fake person. You're looking for the genuine Christian or the person who has shown you respect. Many a time, I don't know how many times uh, before we go through any counseling, a person, especially nowadays, a lot say, please don't judge me. Please don't judge me. You know what they're really asking? Please respect me. 
please respect me. See, there may not be a whole lot I can do for some people. And there may not be an answer that I can give to them. They might. But I can always give them one thing. Every person. Respect. No matter where you come from, what you've done, who you are. I can respect you as a person. And that's what they're asking. They're looking for someone who's genuine and will respect them. And ask yourself when you feel unthankful. Who's been genuine to me? Who's been respectful to me? This is God's word now. What is just in this situation? Who has done you right? Back then you would have asked me that and I'd say nobody. Nobody's done me right. But if I'm really thinking about it, I had several friends who have always done me right. Sometimes you need to ask yourself, too, when it comes to these questions, do I really deserve this? Sometimes the troubles we go through is because we earn those troubles. God still brings troubles in our life to correct us. It's all to make us better, but for correction. You cheat on your wife and she leaves you and you lose your You lose your wife, your family, your home. If you're being honest in this situation. I deserve this. I deserve this. Sometimes you got to go back to the reality. Do I deserve this? And the answer would be yes. Think on these things just in the situation Who or what has been fair? What is pure in this situation? Who has acted innocent towards you? Who is clean in this? Who has been clean in all through this? Who has been pure through this? Number five, what is lovely in this situation? Who or what is well-pleasing to you? Who or what are you glad is with you? I am glad this person is still with me. I messed up, but this person is still here. Or I'm going through some troubles and people have called me. Nowadays, it's text me. People have text. People have reached out. And I'm glad. And this is lovely. Number six. What is a good report in this situation? Who or what can can. Who or what can, can, uh, can commend me in your life? Who has, who has commended me? Who has been there for me? Who can I can commend in this? And that's the honest and good report. Do not feel thankful. Get a pad of paper and write down your answer to these questions. And then as the Bible says, think on these things. Ask yourself these questions, write them down, the answers, and begin to what? Think on these things. Think on, in the middle of disaster, there's always beauty with God. And there's always things to be thankful for and happy about, even if you're in a boat and it's sinking. Thank God I know how to swim. Thank God when I was younger, my dad paid for swimming lessons because he does not know how to swim. And I got some stories about that. He paid for swimming and I'm on a boat and it's sinking. I can swim. I remember thinking that being in the middle of the ocean and, and the ship. And if it sinks, you know, oh, thank God I can swim. But I don't think I can swim that far. And there's sharks. But anyhow... Thank God I can swim. If your life is in a boat and it's sinking, thank God he's taught you how to swim. Thank God. Read through this list and you've answered these questions. It will become your thankful list. And I think that's what a lot of us should do is sit down sometimes and write down, God, I'm thankful for and list them. And have them around and sitting around because the devil and the world and sometimes even our own mind 
wants us to be focused on our problems and our issues, and then we become angry, depressed, bitter, and unthankful. But he's done so much for us. And there are people, other Christians, who've done so much for us that love us and are there. And it's good to have that to look at and remember to think on these things. And then the Bible says in verse 7, and I don't think it's an accident, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus, through Christ Jesus. If we could think on these things, what comes over our hearts and our minds? Peace. Acceptance. I can get through this. Look at all that God has done for me. Look at all what other people have done for me. Look of the blessings I've given. They have been given. Peace will come. The problem doesn't always go away. I remember reading this verse one time and, uh, and struggling with something. And finally, and I literally do this sometimes when I pray to God and I do this. This is the first time I ever did it. I said, okay, it's yours. I went to bed that night. I finally slept that night. I woke up and I had a certain amount of peace. But guess what? The problem was still there. But guess what? I was not. You get it? My mind was not there. My heart was not there. The problem was not me. I'm in peace. My God has it. If all else fails and you think about these six things and you still feel unthankful, let me tell you how God works. I'm driving. I'm almost done. You know what that means when a Baptist preacher says that? You still got 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm driving at work. I'm going to pick up somebody to take back to work. And I park in front of a, a red light. And next to me is a semi truck. And on the side of the semi truck, it says, Jesus loves you. That is awesome. And I began to think about it. And I said, if we just think about that every day, we would be happier people. Jesus loves you. If nothing else works, think on this. Set your mind on this, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. God loves me. Jesus loves me. I know it sounds simple, but it works. God loves the drug addict. God loves the, the, somebody who's committed adultery. God loves the drunkard. God loves the liar. Jesus loves you. No matter what I've done, no matter what I've said, no matter where I am, God loves me. And I might deserve where I put myself right now, and it's my own fault. But God loves me. The Bible tells us a story about a man whose son came to him and said, Dad, I want my inheritance now. I'm paraphrasing badly. It's somewhere. It's like this, someplace. I want my inheritance now. He gave it to him. He says, later. And he left. Did the father say, I'm going to disown him now. Did the father say, he's no longer my son. Did the father say, I hate that boy. The man went and lived a horrible life. Had a party and fun and had friends. Then the money ran out. And when the money runs out, guess what? So do the friends. One of the loneliest things is a drug addict who's out of money. I talk about them a lot because I've done addiction programs. They're out of money. 
They got no friends. And now he had gotten so low, he was so hungry because he was out of money. He's eating pig slop. And I've seen pig slop. I've been on a farm. That is nasty, gross stuff. I don't know where you find anything to eat in that, but that's what he was eating. He was eating what he was feeding the pigs. Pigs will eat anything. And he says, I was better off with my father. Thank God for that. Listen to me, Christian. Wherever you are, you're better off with your father. You're better off with your father. Get back to church. Well, I need to straighten up my life first. You know where you can do that? In church. Get back to church. Get back to your father. And that's what he said. And he began to walk down that road back home. And the Bible says the father saw him from afar off. I love this. God says, if you draw nigh to me, I'll draw nigh to you. And the man, the boy draw nigh to his father. And the father was looking for him and he ran to him. He didn't wait till he got all the way there. He got to him. And grabbed him and said, welcome home. God loves you. He wants the best for you. He wants a better you. A one that's pleasing to him. If nothing else works, focus on this. God loves me. And he's never going to crush me or destroy me. He's never going to make me look foolish. I never have to be embarrassed about my faith and trust in God. He wants to make me well-pleasing to him. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. We have a good God. If nothing else, remember John 3, 16. I like this quote, and then I, I am absolutely done this time. Honestly, this is the truth. I'm not lying. All happy people are grateful. Ungrateful people cannot be happy. We tend to think that being unhappy leads to people complaining. We believe that we kind of think that if unhappy people, that leads to complaining. It's the opposite. But it's truer to say that complaining leads to people becoming unhappy. It's what you think on. It's what you focus on. You want to be truly happy, truly blessed, truly smiling. Focus on these things the Philippians said to focus on. Focus on that. You'll stop your complaining and be happy. But focus on the trouble and the issues and, and the heartache and the heartbreak. And you'll begin to complain and be unhappy. Let us close in prayer.